welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats podcast. We're going to ask you for some opening comments, and then we're going to go to questions. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, uh, I can't believe I wrote that bio of myself. Um, but in any event, um, um, so the Seventh Amendment is uh, interesting. Um, it's it's um, does not get a lot of attention like the uh, First or Second Amendment or the uh, Fifth Amendment. Um, and it has to do with your right to a jury trial in a specific context. Um, I'll just uh, read it uh, very quickly. It says in suits at common law where the value in controversy exceeds $20, the right of a jury trial shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be reexamined by any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. So um, at the, the, the lawyer's way of looking at this will be to break it down, right? And so it starts out with in suits. So in suits means a controversy before a tribunal that's a court or is named a court or is like a court. And then the suits have to be at common law, which means um, if it's not a suit at common law, you're not entitled to a jury. So what would that apply to? Um, a couple of things come immediately to mind. One is maritime law. So, for example, uh, the federal courts might have jurisdiction over um, a, uh, a maritime case, but you wouldn't be entitled to a jury in that case because it's not a suit at common law. And it uh, also does not apply to administrative law. So if you are in an administrative court, uh, you know, so there are various administrative courts which are set up um, by uh, regulators, which are uh, part of the executive branch. Um, if you file suit in administrative court, you're not entitled to a jury um, there as well. The next clause is uh, where the value in controversy exceeds $20. Um, so interestingly, um, when the uh, founders and Madison and friends were drafting these amendments, uh, they didn't think to put um, uh, take inflation into account. So it's still set at $20. If the amount of controversy is $20, which is pretty much every dispute, um, you would be entitled to a jury. Um, so it says the right of the uh, trial by jury shall be preserved and will not be re-examined. No fact tried by a jury will be re-examined in a court of the United States. But then, okay, so you're like, great, so I'm entitled to a jury. And it says then, according to the rules of common law. Okay, so it's telling you there are exceptions to that rule. Um, so we already saw that, for example, if it's maritime or admin law, um, you're outside of your right to a jury trial. And then uh, you have to think about what might be uh, the exceptions um, to a jury trial or the reexamination of um, your jury trial. But before we talk much more about the amendment, I think we should go back to the very basics. What is a jury and what does it do? Um, so in the, in the world of law, cases are divided into issues of fact and issues of law. So fact or is, you know, what happened, um, and law is what is the law. And so those are two separate issues, um, to be decided. So for example, you know, like, uh, to reference the game of clue, you know, the facts would be, was it. Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with the candlestick um, and determining that kind of thing. But whether a murder is against the law under the circumstances is a question of law. So it's broken into those two things. Um, so juries originated in the 11th century in England when uh, it was determined that uh, to have a more efficient system of taxation, it would be helpful to know what everybody owned. So back in those days, what you owned was really a function of your possession. If you were in a house or a plot of land uh, and you controlled it, you owned that. Or if you controlled three cows, those were your cows. And so basically everybody was familiar with what various people owned and by custom, they knew about it. So what they did in order to write down what everybody owned so they could be taxed was to gather a jury of local people who were assumed to be familiar with who had what and have them go out and um, uh, basically testify as to what uh, 
what these facts were. And later, juries became used in trials uh, and then became considered an important part of sort of English civil rights because they were sort of a bulwark against tyranny because the magistrate might align themselves with the king, but the juries would be sort of the final authority um, on um, the facts. Um, and that was considered an important uh, protection uh, for the civil liberties of Englishmen. Um, and so when the Bill of Rights was written, uh, the Sixth Amendment protected jury trials in criminal matters, and the Seventh Amendment protected them, as we read, in civil matters. Uh, so another important thing to understand about the Seventh Amendment is that it does not apply um, to uh, the states. So there's a doctrine called uh, incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment. Uh, the concept of substantive due process. And in that process, to in order to interpret what due process means under the 14th Amendment, um, it will say, uh, well, a due process means that you have First Amendment rights and due process means, and that, that what they've done is in order to define these things better, they say, well, we'll use a, an example from the constitution as to what due process is. And so that's how these things became incorporated against the states and the the right to a jury trial is not incorporated against the states but don't worry most state constitutions protect your right to a civil trial um with similar exceptions um or um uh, you know as as does the federal rule on the seventh amendment um i want to go back to the language real quickly okay. in the seventh amendment about suits at common law and according to the rules of common law. So one of the first things that came up uh, in judicial interpretation of the Seventh Amendment is, what does that mean in terms of the common law? Well, there's a famous case, um, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Um, it's a later case, but basically it's determined that there's no, there's no general federal common law. Um, so what does one look to um, as to what the common law is to determine the exceptions to the Seventh Amendment. Well, um, interestingly, um, the court ruled, and it's uh, maintained this ruling, that it's the common law of English, England in 1791. So if you're determining whether or not you're entitled to a jury under the Seventh Amendment, uh, and you have a novel case, which you would look to is the law of England in 1791, um, and the common law of England as to whether you would be entitled to a jury at that time in an analogous case, right? So I think that's an interesting feature of the rule. Um, and um, that's known as the historical test. Uh, so you look uh, to that period of time. And so it, it's fascinating, but it comes up from time to time that really old English cases can sometimes be applicable to decisions of um, U.S. courts uh, around uh, the Seventh Amendment and some other cases. So um, I want to talk as well about an exception to um, the uh, right to a jury trial, um, which is there's a rule of federal civil procedure um, for a motion for summary judgment or a motion for um, a directed verdict, or it's called a judgment as a matter of law in a jury trial. Um, so a motion for summary judgment is where the way modern civil litigation works, you go out and you do discovery, which means you take everybody's depositions, you sit in a room with a lawyer, they ask questions, you've probably seen one on TV before, um, and then that creates a record of statements that people have made. And then there are other ways to produce facts. Um, but that's largely the way you do it is through uh, submission of exhibits and um, under a sworn affidavit and a deposition. And so at a certain point before you've actually gotten to um, a, a trial, a party can say, I move for a motion for summary judgment based on the facts, and they submit all the relevant portions of the depositions 
Um, there's no issue of material fact as to what happened. And so there's no reason for this to go to a jury because all the jury would decide is what happened and it's evident what happened beforehand. And so in that event, if the judge agrees that there's no material is issue of material fact, then you don't get to a jury trial at all. You don't even get to a trial. They just rule on the law based on all the work that had been done in discovery. Um, so you never get to have that determined by a jury. And the second situation is where you're in the middle of a trial and um, the say the, the uh, plaintiffs are not haven't made their case and they've rested their case or it's at some point of the the process where uh, a defendant or the plaintiff concludes, look, based on the evidence that's been submitted to court, no reasonable jury could come to a different conclusion. And so you move for uh, judgment as a matter of law in a jury trial under Rule 50 of the civil uh, the Code of Civil Procedure. And uh, the court can then say, you know, I agree and I'm just going to direct a verdict and we're going to skip the whole uh, part where the jury determines what the facts are, because I don't think a reasonable jury uh, could make uh, another determination. By the way, you can't do that in a criminal trial, um, but you can do it in a civil trial. And it's it's frequently done. It was just done. This is not a federal trial, but it was just done yesterday uh, or the day before, or maybe a few days before, in the uh, Trump civil trial in um, New York where uh, Trump's attorneys moved for a directed verdict. Uh, they didn't get it um, after they felt that uh, it was an appropriate time to do it. So this stuff actually happens quite frequently. It's an important part of the process. Uh, it's also, uh, it's, it's designed one, to kind of put guardrails on jury decisions. Um, and two, it's also in, intended to streamline the litigation process. Litigation is uh, unbelievably expensive. And um, th there are a couple of off ramps um, with respect to trials, um, which include a motion for summary judgment, uh, motions to dismiss, et cetera, and a motion for directed verdict, which are intended to uh, you know, shut down the process um, to stop uh, uh, the expense and to make it more efficient. Um, so let's just go through some of the law around um, the Seventh Amendment. Um, I, I mentioned that it's the common law of England in 1791. Um, I think uh, also interesting is um, that um, the um, By, by common law, right, the, uh, the, 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 the case law holds that um, it's not merely suits, um, but also uh, legal rights. And so um, anything that determines your legal rights as opposed to equitable rights uh, is subject to um, uh, the, the right to a jury. Um, and I should just point out that the difference between legal and equitable rights are a legal right is a uh, law for which you receive uh, damages, whereas equitable rights are um, uh, where the court orders something. So I'll pause there. I think, Kathy? Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you. That it was a great summary. And I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Janine. Janine, I know you've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to toss it to you. And Janine, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, geez. Okay. Yes, I have a ton of questions. And uh, Eric, that was wonderful. Uh, you know, I'm one of your biggest fans. So uh, thanks again so much. I don't know why these amendments, once you get past, say, the first and the second, are so confusing. <laughs> I consider myself to be, you know, can comprehend most things. And I think, uh, so I want to back it up a little uh, for the students that are listening, because there are all kinds of uh, terminologies that are being thrown out. Um, so I want to kind of go back 
to basics. But before, in regard to the, and, you know, this can be like a really quick answer because I only get my 10 minutes. Um, I, the, tr explain this, this, the, the, tr the, the trial with Trump in New York City, is that a civil trial? Common law trial? It's a civil trial, yes. The trial in New York City is a civil trial brought under a statute which allows the attorney general to bring a civil action for fraud. Okay. Um, and yeah, now I saw something, I saw something and, and you, you can, you know, it doesn't mean it's true just because I saw it, but my dad used to always say that just because it's in the press doesn't mean it's true. Um, I, I, I saw something that said that Trump asked for, a, so he's at, he was asking for a jury trial, right? But he asked for it too late, that it had to be asked for at the beginning. Is that true? Before I the don't trial know started. whether that's true or not. I saw yesterday that his lawyers asked for a directed verdict. So they. But what does that pay. mean? See, we don't know what a directed verdict means. Sure. The directed verdict would be, I want the I want the judge to find that uh, we prevail, without going to uh, a jury to um, determine any of the facts. To just. Uh, essentially say the trial's over and here's the outcome. Um, and obviously they move forward to be decided in their favor. And that the, the, the court in that case declined to do that. Before the, the court had, I believe, uh, ruled on a motion for summary judgment that uh, based on the facts that it was, there were no disputes of fact as to whether or not the Trump Organization had committed fraud, but that was appealed immediately. Um, his orders with respect to it were stayed, and uh, they went to this trial stage. Though in the, it's a pretty complex case, so I don't know all the details of okay here and there. Well, let uh, that's very that's just very confusing because I mean, obviously he didn't think he'd committed fraud, so it was just the other side that thought he had committed. Anyway, okay. Summary judgment. What I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out terms, and you can come back and just give me like quick summary judgment. What does that mean? So summary judgment would be, um, let's say, uh, two parties, party A and party B, uh, have a dispute. Party A sues party B, and they interview various witnesses, and there's no disagreement between party A and party B as to what happen. So you take a look at all the witnesses and you say, you don't need to judge their credibility. It's clear that X, Y, and Z happened. So if that happens, then you immediately go to a ruling of law. So you're finding basically that it was Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with the candlestick. Everybody agrees that that's true. So now the question is, as a matter of law, was it murder? Now in the civil trial, it's obviously murders, that's a criminal case, but that's the example. So basically all the facts are known and there's no dispute around the material facts. Now, where you couldn't have a motion for summary judgment would be you interview two witnesses and one witness says X happened and the other witness says, no, X didn't happen, Y happened. Then you have, and it's material to the case. Then you have to go to a jury or a trier of fact, but it's going to be a jury uh, to determine that. Okay, so summary judgment means everyone agrees and you don't need a jury. Everyone, there's no, dis everyone agrees about the, what are the material facts, right? So uh, for, for example, if it's a car accident, everyone, there's nobody who's saying that the car wasn't hit from behind, right? Um, and so there's, there's no que question of, the circumstances of the accident, like for example, did the car in front back into the car behind it? If there's no dispute about yeah. that, you can go directly to who was liable. So, but but you said if you have a summary, if, if there's a summary judgment, you don't need a trial. But if someone disagrees, you would need a trial. So summary judgment would mean you don't need a trial. Right. It means everyone agrees okay. about what happened. Okay. All right. So now let's back up a little bit for the students that are listening and talk about because the, the different amendments here that we've been dealing with, like the we're on the seventh, so fifth, sixth, seventh, all deal with talk about the different type 
of trials that happen and who brings them, whether you keep talking about criminal and say, and this one is, um, this one is um, considered common law. So is that another word for that civil, a civil trial? Uh, civil trials don't have to be common law. They could be maritime law or they could be administrative law. Um, so there are other areas of law that are uh, suits not at common law, which would bring them out of the Seventh Amendment. Um, but when okay, you think well, of I, I want to ask, I want to ask, sorry to interrupt, I'm just sorry. I, I want to ask that question, but first I want to go back. Is common law different than civil law? It, it, don't go, go to the maritime thing. Is that the same thing or is it different? So in other words, someone says, well, they didn't win in a, they didn't win in the federal suit, you know, but now they're going to be tried in civil, you know, the civil court. So is that the same thing as common law or is that different? Yes or no? Um, it's not the same thing. So common law, also, there's there's such a thing as a common law crime. Most common law crimes are now gone because they've been, common law was back in England, uh, the courts would decide that, that a case based on, well, these are the customs of the the English people. And so, for example, if I go and cut down your tree without your permission, it was a custom of the English people that you couldn't do that. And so common law would be, the judge would find that that's the common law, which is basically saying everyone pretty much agrees that that's the rule. Um, and so, and then courts- But what's would, a civil trial? I'm sorry, I only have a few minutes. A what's, civil what's a trial civil trial is a dispute between two people where, where it's not a dispute between the state and the people. So for example, a criminal trial is something where it's the people against the defendant, right? who's been accused of the crime. Um, so whenever you see a criminal trial, it will be styled as the people versus. So in a civil trial, it's, um, you know, Tova Kaplan versus Eric Wise defendant. Um, that would be a civil trial. Now, it, Tova's claim against me could be, um, I cut down her tree without her permission. Um, I trespassed on her property. Uh, I. I, I went into her kitchen and without her permission started cooking and burned down her house. Um, those would all be civil claims against me. They might be criminal too. Um, but those would be civil claims for me where I would owe her damages, um, potentially, if she could prove that um, I did it without her permission and that I was negligent or something like that. So uh, a contract claim, that's a civil claim. Um a there are what, civil what, okay what, what what what's the difference in common law then if you cut down somebody's tree is that not the same as burning down their house well it could be common law but it doesn't have to it's so confusing it could be, it could <laughs> it just, be statutory it just, too it just blows my mind i usually okay i'm gonna ask you a few questions and i'm gonna go i don't know what my time is Lacey. i'm always so confused about where i'm supposed to stop maybe hold up tell me where i am so um maritime what does that mean so maritime is a, 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 a category of laws that apply to sailors and ships on the water and sometimes in ports. Um, so like a common law, a maritime law uh, issue might be, uh, can the captain of a ship marry two passengers? The, the general rule. Okay. Uh, and we, we talked about last week. That, that, that the captain of the ship can marry two people. Okay, so I have one minute remaining. Those minutes, I can't read what it says at the bottom. I have one hour remaining. Um, okay, so because we talked last week that, that you know military had their own tribunals. Um, all right, I have one minute left, so I'm going to ask uh, administrative law. So can you explain? See, I'm really just trying to get to the nuts and bolts so students understand what civil is, what federal is, what administrative is, what maritime is. And since I only have a minute left, uh, what is administrative? So administrative law, this the example that most people would know would be um, something like the EPA, right? Where most of the law has been made by a regulatory body. And um, there's a suit that arises, say, for example, under uh, uh, somebody owns a gas station and they had a leaky fuel tanks under the gas station. And I bought the gas station and I want to sue to recover. There might be a claim under administrative law 
for that, and that would be a civil claim between uh, two parties, uh, potentially determined in an administ in administrative court, uh, which would would uh, maybe be a less formal proceeding. But um, that's what administrative law is. It's it's sort of all that okay. stuff. So, so in, in closing here, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, they all deal, deal with different types of courts. And this is the common law. Can you run through what fifth and sixth is just for the students so they know? And then I got to go like really quick answer. The fifth like amendment 10 seconds. Is, is due process. And uh, mm -hmm. the sixth amendment is the right to a civil trial uh, of your peers, of a jury of your peers uh, in a criminal case. So I said civil trial, right to a mm -hmm. jury trial it, of yeah. your peers mm -hmm. in a criminal case. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Eric Wise. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you so much for that overview. I just had a few questions. I'll be relatively brief to give everyone else a chance, but I was curious if you could talk a bit about um, how the idea of a jury developed in general. Like you you talked a bit about its English origins, but I'm curious because uh, we have such a formalized jury system. Like we all, when we picture jury, we have a, a very specific image, um, but how did that develop? Uh, and and in, the, in the constitution, it, it literally just says, right of trial by jury. It doesn't have a lot of details about what that looks like. Um, so could you talk about how that idea developed and then what were the mechanisms of how it developed? Was it through law? Was it through uh, litigation of the court system? Was it something that the founders would have already understood? Uh, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, okay, I'm going to go even further back than the Domesday book. Um, bef before the Domesday book, uh, if you had a dispute in, in England or in some place where the Saxons governed. Um, those disputes were determined by trial by combat. So, uh, you know, Tova um, sues me in 900 AD in England uh, over her tree and it's decided we both show up, um, you know, with swords and we figure out um, who was right by virtue of who comes out alive not really a great system, and people recognize that right away. Well, the system develops a little bit further, um, and uh, people start hiring champions to fight on their behalf. So wealthy people would pick a fight at, at law, and they'd have trial by combat. They'd show up uh, with their six-foot friend and say, I've paid him uh, to you know, um, be a champion on my behalf. So out of that, crazy system through the idea of having lawyers. Uh, and rather than chopping each other to bits, um, they would determine it by arguing over the law. And from that arose the concept of a passive judge. So the judge would just make sure that all the rules were complied with, but the two uh, advocates would fight it out. And the idea was that with both of them fighting it out, biased towards their side, that the truth would emerge, and then the, uh, the, the judge would be able to decide what really happened and make a ruling that was fair. Um, so then in the 11th century, um, the, like I said, the English wanted to get a little more sophisticated about how they were doing taxes. It's, all, it's always about raising revenue um, in one way or another. And so they came up with the idea they're going to put together this book that says what everybody owns, you know, from north to south, from east to west. And how are they going to do that? Well, you can't just go and ask people what they own, because some people are going to be clever enough to say, I own everything that I can see from my front porch and everything behind it, too. Um, so what they did was they gathered juries. And so the juries would sort of have several different opinions and they were from the local areas and they would decide, they were supposed to be familiar with the local facts and they would decide, well, I know that Mrs. Jones owns seven cows because I've seen her with the seven cows. And another one of the jurors would say, you know, I've seen her with the seven cows too. And another one says, I think she only has three cows. And like, well, two of us think they're seven cows and you think they're three. I think she has seven cows, right? And so then they put it down in the book. So they were basically a fact finding panel that went out and put together all these facts so they'd have a giant book of what everyone owned so they could tell them how much they owed in taxes at the end of the year. Well, the system caught on and people were like, well, this is a pretty good way to find out what's happened locally. And so we should use that in our court system 
and have juries, for example, determine what are the facts in the cases. So originally those juries were supposed to, uh, we always think of like the jury's supposed to be impartial now, but back then the jury was supposed to be sort of partial. The jury's supposed to know, well, you know, Mrs. Jones, she's been known to cut down other people's trees. And this is a case where someone's saying she cut down their tree. And so um, we're going to find the facts about whether that actually happened, but we know some of the local facts. So we're already uh, involved. Um, and because juries were not trained in law, the idea was, well, the juries would just decide the facts because that's what they're good at. And the judges will um, uh, decide what the law is and apply it to the facts as the jury determines it. Um, so uh, there's a famous saying, by the way, in law that if you, you know, uh, uh, they teach the lawyers is if you have good facts, you should pound the facts. If you have good law, you should pound the law. And if you don't have anything, you should pound the table, um, which is sort of a joke. Um, but um, it's it's the joke is divided up into these two parts of the way you determine what's happened um, under the Anglo-Saxon system. Now, in on the continent of Europe, it was done differently. You had a magistrate uh, who was basically your judge, and he was proactive. He could ask questions. He didn't simply listen to the case. He would go and find out what happened. Sometimes he was called an inquisitor. And inquisitors obviously have uh, the name um, is often associated with the Catholic inquisitions where they would go uh, and look for heretics and uh, oppress other people. But the um, an inquisitor was a judge whose job was to like inquire as to what happened and take a proactive role. And he would determine both the facts and the law. So the Anglo-Saxon system was different. It evolved over time into being an essential part of English civil liberties. And when the American Revolution happened, you know, a, a big part of the American Revolution was about preserving the English civil liberties that had developed because the Americans felt like, well, the king was running roughshod over them because they were not an easy bunch to get along with uh, because they weren't very happy about taxation without representation and other things. And so part of the revolution was to preserve what they felt were English rights, which were not being appropriately protected by the crown for the colonials. So when the, the American revolution ended, the idea was not to it was separate yourself entirely from the law of England, but to continue it. So many of the states still had the same common laws uh, and, um, and the idea of a trial by jury now, the exact number, um, you know, I'm not sure that's probably determined by statute um, because it certainly doesn't say anywhere in the amendment uh, how many people you need to have on a jury. It's 12, it can be nine. Um, in a, By the way, in a civil trial, a jury does not have to be unanimous. It's not like a, a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, you know, um, you know, 12 Angry Men, right, was the a film about uh, the lack of unanimity where one person objects uh, to um, a verdict and then persuades the others. That doesn't happen in a civil trial. Civil trial, if half the jury thinks um, that these are what the facts are, that's what they become for purposes of the judgment. So um, that's that's how we got there. And so then in each of 50 states, right, there are different rules for trial by jury in a civil trial. Um, and then for the when things are tried when there's a civil trial in a federal court, okay, usually that's going to be on what they call diversity jurisdiction, or often it will be, which means, uh, you know, Tobin's in New York and Eric Wise is in Connecticut. And so neither of us wants to be in somebody else's home court advantage. So we sue in federal court with the idea that a federal court will not be biased for or against us because we're from a particular state. Um, and so that's the that's the kind of thing. And then I'd like to just address this question of, which is sort of one of our themes, why do only 1% of civil cases get resolved to trial? And the reason is that uh, there, there's, there are several stages in a trial. Uh, the first is a motion to dismiss. So I file a complaint that says I've been damaged. Tova cut down my tree without my permission and um, I've been damaged. Um, and so uh, Tova's lawyers come back and they say um, his, his complaint 
is improperly formed. Uh, it's it's everybody's right and everybody knows it to cut down any trees that um, you know are in this area. And so there, there's not an issue here. So you should dismiss. But if you do, if you get past the dismissal, which means that there's actually an issue to be resolved by the court, um, then you go to discovery. And discovery becomes super expensive because I've got we've now got to interview everybody who saw the tree, saw the saw, right? Take depositions and pay lawyers, you know, uh, one to represent uh, the, the deponent uh, who's being questioned and a lawyer to do the questioning. And maybe if it's a special case, there'll be two on each side. Right. It adds up really quickly. Um, and there's a lot of paperwork uh, flying back and forth. Um, so people tend to settle at that point because as you're doing discovery, it becomes uh, things come out that are favorable or unfavorable uh, in that process. And people say, hey, you know, do I really want to keep spending money? Because I might lose. And then they settle. And nobody's happy with how the settlement turns out. But then that's not going to a jury trial. And then say you get all the way through to discovery. And you start your trial. Well, say you get all the way through to discovery. And... Uh, TOA files a motion for summary judgment says, we look, we've got all the facts out here and there's no material fact in dispute. And so we should just get a judgment. Um, and then you skip a trial because you just get a judgment there. Uh, then we go to trial and uh, in the middle of the trial, we put all our witnesses on and my witnesses are terrible. They contradict themselves. Doesn't look good. So Toba moves for a directed judgment or directed verdict. Um, and the court grants it. And so there's no jury trial uh, there. Um, so basically the, uh, the number of actual civil trials because of the expensive litigation and the number of off ramps means that there are very few times that uh, an action uh, actually gets to a trial, a jury trial. Great, well, thank you for that very thorough answer. Um, I, I really learned a lot. And now I'll pass on some audience questions. Thank you. I think we're going to go to Jewel and Jorn next. Well, uh, I thought that um, that was one of the coolest things, the craziest things I ever heard, which you described about the champions and that being the uh, lawyer uh, development to lawyers. That is a crazy piece of information. Awesome to learn. And I think would make a really good uh, TV show at some point. Um, but <laughs> the uh, one question that I had was, um, as far as uh, just just trying to, of course, answer as quickly. I know that this could be a really long answer, but um, there's this, it costs a lot to go to court, of course. And if we're talking about a civil trial, um, even anything over twenty dollars, there are so many costs, and the way that the law has been set up has now made it so that you almost can't represent yourself not necessarily because you can't defend your case in court but you but you'll get caught on some misfiling error or some something where you it's not even necessarily that you can't present the facts it's that there will be some procedure that that then gets your case thrown out or that you are then you know liable you lose so do we, is there any, via, do we, could we almost say that there's a violation of the Seventh Amendment just in that you can't go to civil, uh, you don't get a civil trial when you can't pay for everything to get your trial heard? I think that's a very good point, um, right? Um, so let's uh, go to one of my favorite movies, um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird uh, with Gregory Peck, right? Uh, so that's a criminal trial, but uh, it's uh, representative of what used to be done in trials uh, before changes to the uh, civil procedure code. So uh, one lawyer uh, would show up in court and put his witnesses on and ask them questions on the stand and wouldn't know what they were going to say and wouldn't have had a lot of time to prepare. And um, that you know, it, you, you you had to be ready to cross-examine or examine a witness. And potentially if you were going to catch them in a lie and people uh, unfortunately do lie uh, when they're on the stand, particularly when their interests are at stake um, and you'd have to figure it out. But th that system of litigation was far less expensive 
and it wasn't, but it wasn't really aimed at getting to the truth of the matter. It was aimed at uh, getting to a final result, right? Because uh, if if you and I have a dispute, there there are two arguments about what should be done. Should we really get it right, um, and you know make sure that we're absolutely certain about who was in the right and who was in the wrong um, before we you know award somebody a money judgment in that case, um, or should we just resolve the dispute, right? And quickly decide who was right and who was wrong so that we can move on, right? So that we don't have to sit there uh, for two years. Uh, litigation is, drives all kinds of animosities between the parties. It intensifies them, in fact, after there's already been uh, a feeling of wrong that brought somebody to sue. But so the American federal civil procedure and all the states pretty much copied it, went in the direction of, um, having discovery, pretrial discovery. Um, and that's what makes it enormously expensive. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that it's a very fair point that our judicial system needs reform, maybe to go back to something like the old system, where what's more important is just getting a result and not getting the perfect result. Because what's happened is that litigation has really become a privilege of the very wealthy right, who can afford to spend, I mean, litigations go on over not very complex issues where there are fees of a million dollars a month on both sides, um, right? Obviously, the the 99.999% of Americans could never afford to be in that kind of dispute and would have to back away from a dispute where uh, someone raised those issues. Um, it also leads to people using litigation as a weapon. Um, because if I sue you and you don't defend, then it's possible that I can get a default judgment against you. Um, or your alternative is to incur the legal fees. And that, that's used um, by, and you're not supposed to do it. Obviously, there are remedies and um, abuse of process and other, but that's also another litigation, right, you have to bring. Um, so uh, I think you raised a very good point. Um, I don't think there's any great ground in existing court cases that that's a violation. I mean, our whole system is built around it. Uh, it'd be a pretty radical thing if the Supreme Court said, you know, this entire system of pretrial discovery, because it favors the wealthy and stops you from getting your trial, is it deprives you of your civil rights under the Seventh Amendment. But would, I think would, from very quickly, um, so would that reform happen in Congress? In Congress or in a state legislature. I think it's a great thing to advocate for. Um, uh, you know, lawyers will always, will argue, because um, we, we actually do take joy and turn it into misery. Um, but um, lawyers will argue that, uh, you know, it's better to be precise and justice requires that it be exact. But of course, that's how they make their money. There'd be a lot far fewer lawyers uh, if, if, the, the rules were simpler. The yeah. more complex they are, the more you need a lawyer. Once upon a time, you know, you could, uh, law was just much simpler. People could represent themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's not uh, clear to me, and I think there's a, a case to be made, that that system was uh, maybe imprecise, but because of its accessibility, more fair. All right, Jordan, do you have a Everyone, you want to ask? Uh, well, I just wasn't sure uh, what you want to do, Kathy. I can ask one or we can jump to audience. Well, you can go ahead. Let's get a question from you, Jorn. We definitely want okay. to hear from you today. Yeah, I'm a little I'm a little curious about common law. And so you had said that the last time that what we is it what we still go off of that was kind of understood in 1781. I believe that's the date you said. And has there been any movement to, you know, kind of update common law? Uh, yeah, so really that's it. Yes. So much of common law has been codified into statutes. So legislatures have decided to, uh, you know, uh, write it all down into a set of rules and pass it as a law rather than court-made law. But common law still exists. I mean, one area where it's still prominent 
is uh, in uh, the area of tort. So tort is where you you know you sue for uh, damages for an injury. So I'm running down the street um, and I drop a, a box of firecrackers. Uh, firecrackers go off and Jorn uh, uh, gets is startled and runs into a plate glass window. Uh, and so Jorn sues me for negligently carrying this box of fireworks and for his damages for running through the window, right? And that's tort. And the basic rules of tort are, are simple. Uh, they are, was there a duty, which is my duty not to be negligent? Was there a breach of the duty? Was I actually negligent? Um, did my breach of the duty cause Jorn to run through the plate glass window? And finally, was, was Jorn uh, injured by it or damaged by it, if I can prove all that? So there are four elements, and those are common law elements, and there's well-developed case law that goes way back. Um, and that's why it has a funny name, tort law, because it was, uh, you know, um, uh, old Anglo-Saxon word uh, to describe those kinds of civil disputes. It's still out there, but there's much less common law than there used to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We want to take a minute and recognize our students and teachers that are on with us today. Uh, we have got Noelle Tokarov with students from Northwood University, D'Angela Hines with students from Emerald Coast Christian Academy, Nellie Shea with the Danville Public Schools in Danville, Virginia, and Alan Amadal with uh, 25 Albany High School students. So we welcome all the teachers and students. If you're a teacher or student watching and we didn't give you a shout out, be sure and let us know and we'll uh, try to do that before the program's over. We also wanna thank our listeners on Las Vegas's KKVV 1060 on the AM dial. Uh, our program airs Monday evenings at 6 p.m. Pacific on KKVV in Las Vegas. So thank you, KKVV and all who listen in Las Vegas. Uh, Eric, we uh, have got some great questions here. Uh, we're going to lead off with uh, Jean Marie Smith, who asks, why would a judge use the Rule 50 motion to dismiss but not throwing out the civil trial from the start? Why let it go through the plaintiff's case and then uh, throwing it out or dismissing it? That's a very good question. So in order for that rule to um, be available for use, you have to have gotten to a stage where the facts have been developed at trial. Um, and then, uh, so the, the classic example is I have two witnesses um, on my behalf. Those two witnesses show up. I put on my case and their testimony on cross-examination completely falls apart, right? So at that point, the judge is looking at it and says, there's no reasonable way that a jury could find facts that lead to uh, liability. So all there is left for me to do is supply um, the law to the case. And so uh, I'll just move uh, for, I'll just accept the movement for a directed verdict and direct the verdict uh, or directed the judgment. Um, so the, the, at the motion for summary judgment, you haven't gone to trial, but you've, you've gotten far enough along in discovery and discovery is completed. And so once discovery is completed, you file a motion for summary judgment, which attaches to it all the affidavits that you say support your motion for summary judgment then that the other party submits their own motion uh, opposing summary judgment and attaches all their facts. And then the judge reads both of them and says, you know, I'm reading all the attachments and I don't see that you have any disagreement about what happened here. So based on right this, this idea of one party and another party opposing it, right? So they, maybe somebody left something out. Maybe there is a material fact that's disputed, but I forgot to put it in my pleading. The judge is entitled to just look at what you put in front of them and say, I'm ruling on a motion for summary judgment. There are no issues of material fact here. I'm going right to a judgment on the law. Well, thank you. And then Tracy asks, can you talk a little bit about the selection process between if being serving on a federal jury or a state jury? Is the selection process the same or is it different? 
Uh, and I think it'd be great if you just talk a little bit in general about the importance of serving on juries. I know so often when we get a jury notice, the first thing we think of is how can I get out of this? And um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of of that to to just being a good citizen and, and the importance of citizenship? Yeah, uh, every citizen has uh, two fundamental uh, offices that they automatically hold just by being a citizen of the United States. One is your voter. And so you have the office of a voter um, in the various places where you're entitled to vote um, for the federal government, for your local government, for your state government, and so on. And the other one is uh, the office of juror. So you can be selected uh, and compelled to serve as a juror. And um, it's in both, uh, we don't need to say why the office of voting is important. Everybody should do it, absent, uh, in my view, um, some, you know, uh, you know, real difficulty that they can't bring themselves to vote. Um, or if they're abstaining, they should be, you know, there are ways to do that too. You can do a write-in um, yourself, <laughs> but you can vote and show up and vote. Um, but for jury duty, you know, you want, if you ever go to trial, now I realize that not many cases go to trial, but if you ever go to trial, you want competent trial's effect. And so you should take that office seriously and serve and to try and serve without bias and to really understand the facts, even though it's an enormous uh, uh, time sink and nobody really loves to do it. Um, so the process of selection is, uh, we, as I mentioned before, uh, once upon a time, they wanted the jurors to know stuff about the case and to have an opinion already, because the idea was that they fact finding was a function of getting people from the locality who already knew stuff about parties. And they would, that was the idea was they'd be better at determining the facts that way. We've gone to a system where we're, we want them to come with a clean slate and we're going to present facts to them and they're going to decide based on those facts and bring in no outside facts into the jury box other than common, very basic common knowledge. Well, um, thank you. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, the last thing is the lawyers ask them questions to determine whether they have some bias and that's called voir dire. Um, which is, I think, French. Um, well, thank you, Eric. And we're right at the top of the hour. And we want to thank you so much for being here today and, and your great explanations of the Seventh Amendment. And we want to remind everyone that next week we will not have a Constitutional Chats podcast as it is Thanksgiving week. We will resume the week after Thanksgiving. We want to remind everyone also to please go to our website, click on the big red button and get in your bids on our Constituting America auction, which ends this Thursday night at 10 Eastern. We're almost halfway to our goal. We've got a little bit more than 48 hours left. And we would just be so appreciative of you all helping us uh, make your bids that fund these programs and so many other great constitution education programs. So, uh, Janine, Jewel, Jorn, uh, any, I know, I think Toba had to leave, but any uh, parting words? It was a great show, and uh, thank you for the things we don't get to hear often about. It was pretty cool. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And thank you, Eric. Thank you.